Is it going? Um, refreshing the pages, it should be going. Okay. Yeah. I can start even while it's not going. Um, <laughs> I would just like to, a couple quick notes. We, the board created a lecture survey and that poll, I will post a link to it. It's online. It's, it should only take a couple of minutes to do. And we're asking all members and then guests because our lectures are open to the general public to complete the survey if you would like. It is very quick. I think there are about 10 questions. Um, and we would just like to get a general overview and some input from our members and guests. We just found out today that the Mount Tam public nights ran by the Friends of Mount Tam and their astronomy wing. Uh, most likely those events will be online again this year. But our next members only night for the SFA is on Saturday, March 26th. And if you are a member, I hope you can join us. And if you need a parking pass, if you did not receive yours, tomorrow should be the latest day you can request one for that event. And if you have any questions about any of those things, please let me know. You can email me or send me a chat message in Zoom, but I will place the link to the lecture survey in the chat window as soon as the lecture starts and feel free to click it and complete the survey. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so I will. I'm Linda Mahan, and I'm going to introduce briefly the next two speakers for, the, for April and for the month of May. Um, in April on the 20th, and we always meet on the third Wednesday of each month, the title of the presentation is N minus one, Alone in the Milky Way. It's presented by Dr. Pascal Lee, who's the founder and chairman of the Mars Institute. He's also the principal investigator of the Houghton Mars Project, which is headquartered at NASA Ames. The Drake Equation was formulated in 1961 by Frank Drake. It was not so much to quantify the number of civilizations in our Milky Way, but to develop a way to stimulate possible scientific dialogue and a um, estimate of advanced civilizations. Pascal Lee will revisit the Drake Equation with us with a new perspective. Um, in May 18, Imaging Extrasolar Planets by Bruce McIntosh, who's a physics professor at Stanford and the de deputy director of KIPAC. KIPAC stands for the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. In the past two and a half decades, more than 4,000 planets have been discovered orbiting other stars. However, we still don't know if our solar system is unique. Find out about the first ever images of other solar systems and as well as future planet hunting space telescopes that are in the works. Um, the ultimate goal is detection of a second pale blue dot, an Earth twin. So we hope you will attend both of these presentations and they will be recorded also. We're very happy to have Ken Lum with us tonight for his presentation. He's a retired emergency room doctor who became interested in astronomy and its history while in high school inspired by the space race of the 1960s. Having built a telescope at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, where he grew up, he also became interested in the history of the telescope. After dropping out of astronomy during college to pursue his medical studies, he became re-interested uh, after starting to work again. He currently uses a unistellar EV scope. This is one of the ones that are new in the world. He has a Celestron C925 and an AP Traveler and a Takahashi Sky 90 refractor for most of his observations. He joined the Antique Telescope Society in 1994, two years after it was founded, when the society came west to tour the Lick Observatory, the Old Chabot Observatory, and the Ricard Observatory at the University of Santa Clara. He's continued to attend many of the Antique Telescope Society tours and meetings over the years until they were temporarily halted by the pandemic. We welcome Ken Lum's talk and he takes us on his travels into antique telescope history. And also we're going to have this as a two-part presentation. We're going to go into the older period of uh, astronomical history. And then Ken's going to take it up again on June 20th and talk about more current 
things that the Ant Antique Telescope Society has been involved with. So this is part one of a two-part journey, and we thank Ken Lum very much. Okay, so um, see, I guess I'll screen share here, and uh, where's the screen share? Here it is, okay. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes, we do. Okay, very good. So let me uh, start this uh, uh, slideshow here. Okay. For, okay, That's everybody's great. got that uh, looking pretty good. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction, uh, Linda. And um, and uh, as I as she said that you know as I was putting this together, I realized that uh, this was uh, too long of a story to uh, just keep uh, to uh, to be able to do a proper job of it uh, just in one hour. So I've decided to divide this thing up into two uh, one hour uh, presentations, one for today, which will cover the period from the invention of the telescope, which was in 1608 uh, to uh, around 1800. And then uh, uh, when I come back on July the 20th, uh, we'll cover uh, the, the second uh, half of the history of the telescope, uh, which uh, from uh, from 1800 uh, into as far into the present day as possible, uh, uh, and uh, with, uh, assuming uh, 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 at least uh, so far as uh, uh, telescopes are still considered to be antiques. Um, so anyway, this is a picture of the Yerkes Observatory, uh, the 40 inch uh, at, uh, in Wisconsin. And uh, so today uh, we begin just the uh, first, uh, uh, the first half of the of the presentation. So anyway, the Antique Telescope Society was, as as um, uh, as Linda mentioned, was started in 1992 by a group of mostly East Coasters who were interested in old telescopes, uh, and uh, it was primarily a group of people uh, around the Boston, and New York area, and uh, they decided to organize uh, this. Uh, this group, uh, uh, and it includes uh, this website that you see here, uh, where uh, they publish some of the research and uh, and uh, and uh, techniques for working with uh, old telescopes. <clears throat> and uh, they, for a while, they published a journal called the uh, Journal of the Antique Telescope Society, which contains a, a lot of articles that you wouldn't find in uh, most uh, other kinds of professional professional journals. And uh, we also started a, uh, a group, uh, an internet group. Uh, initially, it was on Yahoo, uh, but uh, it's been, uh, because Yahoo shut down the group uh, feature, uh, it's been moved over to, um, uh, to the uh, groups.io. Uh, and uh, so many of you have probably uh, subscribed to uh, groups.io, and uh, it's, uh, it's actually a very nice feature. But uh, nonetheless, this is where, uh, members of the club uh, communicate with each other and uh, discuss uh, aspects of uh, working with old telescopes. Now, many of our members uh, are also collectors and restorers of old telescopes. And here's an example of, of a, uh, a complete telescope setup, uh, uh, probably about 100 years old, that uh, one member uh, restored. And uh, during our annual meetings, uh, uh, many, many of these people bring uh, these uh, uh, old telescopes for show and tell. Um, now here's an example of an old telescope that was uh, 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 picked up in a rather unusual fashion. Uh, this uh, five inch uh, uh, refractor belongs to a fellow by the name of Steve Noble who uh, lives in Santa Clara actually. And he acquired it uh, while he was a high school student in uh, Portland, Maine. And uh, one day he was in class and he heard a couple of guys dumping a bunch of junk out the window into a dumpster. And when his class was over, uh, he decided to run upstairs and find out what was going on. And uh, he found uh, one of these guys about ready to dump this out of the second floor of the window into the dumpster. And he, and he uh, quick thinking, he, uh, uh, he, uh, he stopped him and uh, offered to take the thing for free. And uh, so he was uh, given this telescope. It turned out to be, uh, let's see, oops, there it is. Okay, it turned out to be a uh, telescope made by 
uh, Henry Fitz, who was the uh, first um, major telescope maker here in the United States, who was active during the 1850s. And indeed, this telescope, uh, according to the backplate of the focuser here, dates from 1850. So, uh, so just as a uh, just as a matter of uh, a happenstance, uh, this telescope was saved from destruction. Now, some of the other members are kind of super collectors, like this fellow, uh, Bob Ariel, uh, who was a collector of uh, old um, Alvin Clark uh, refractors. And he uh, not only collected them, but he also spent a lot of his time uh, restoring them back to usefulness. And uh, he eventually uh, co-authored a book about the Clarks uh, called Artists in Optics, which is still available. You can purchased it on the internet, and it was uh, co-authored by uh, Deborah Jean Warner. And uh, this is sort of the definitive, uh, uh, for those interested in these old refractors from the late uh, 19th century, uh, this is a definitive uh, reference book uh, on that subject. Uh, he, unfortunately, um, uh, Bob uh, passed away some years ago, and he uh, gave his collection to the South Carolina, uh, the South Carolina State Museum, which is located in Columbia, South Carolina. So if you're ever in that area, maybe civilly visiting Civil War sites and things like that, um, uh, you might uh, uh, drop into this museum and take a look at the, uh, Bob's collection of old uh, restored uh, Clark refractors. Another person who's a bit kind of a super collector is this fellow. He was a past president of the ATS, uh, John Briggs. Uh, there is a, that's the, the picture of him in the present day. And then on the uh, right is a picture of him as a young man as he was uh, discovering his passions. Um, he was uh, born, in, uh, born and raised in Boston but uh, ultimately went to work as an instrument engineer for the University of Chicago uh, at Yerkes Observatory. And then he was subsequently sent to work at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in uh, New Mexico. And uh, while he was in New Mexico, he was sniffing around and found a little town called uh, Magdalena, New Mexico, uh, where he ultimately settled and retired. Uh, he, while he was there, he um, purchased this uh, old WPA vintage uh, theater and turned it into a warehouse for his uh, enormous collection of old telescopes and telescope parts. And you can see that there's uh, already a dome uh, to the left there that's part of his collection. And then the interior of his uh, warehouse is uh, just a, a great mass of old telescopes. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, in the center right, is uh, you can see a wooden German equatorial mount. Uh, actually, that used to be mine. Uh, when I got back into amateur astronomy back in 1986, uh, I wanted to build a really big telescope, and I had a uh, uh, I had the experience uh, from my high school days uh, how to do of how to do that. So I purchased this uh, German equatorial mount from uh, the maker, a uh, fellow by the name of Pierre Schwar. Uh, down in Tucson, Arizona, uh, made some improvements on it and used it for a long time, uh, for, for a number of years, uh, holding a 14 and a quarter inch uh, Newtonian uh, re reflector. There's a, a close up uh, view of that uh, mount. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what the telescope looked like uh, during its heyday uh, back in the 90s when I was uh, carrying it around in that van in the, in the background. Uh, and um, but anyway, I subsequently broke up the tube assembly and sold off all the parts, including that the four inch AP refractor mounted on the top. And I only kept the mount and I passed the mount on to uh, Gene Cross, the late Gene Cross, who was an optical engineer at, uh, uh, at Lockheed Martin. And then he passed it on to John. And so uh, and now that I am old enough that some of my possessions can be considered to be antiques, uh, I'm proud to say that he has a possession of uh, one of my uh, old telescope uh, components. Uh, anyway, the rest of his uh, collection is uh, scattered all around that uh, old theater. And you can see his, uh, his uh, dwelling is just a gigantic uh, a playground of uh, telescopes. Uh, and he also collects uh, old books and journals uh, from universities that uh, give these things away. 
actually most of his telescopes, so he tells me, have been acquired basically for free from uh, astronomy departments that no longer have any need for uh, for these uh, for these old instruments. You can see that uh, his place is just jam absolutely jam packed with telescopes. And uh, uh, should you have a desire to go visit, say. Uh, the facilities that are nearby, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or the very large array in uh, New Mexico, uh, he's more than happy to uh, give you a tour of his uh, collection. He's, it's, it's quite impressive, uh, although I must confess I've actually not been there myself. I've not been able to find the time to make it down to Mexico to, uh, to New Mexico to visit his place. But, I, uh, but he gave a presentation of it, which is uh, available on YouTube. So if you um, search for John Briggs uh, Telescope Lyceum, uh, which is what he calls his place. Um, you can find his uh, video, a uh, video recording of his presentation about his collection. Uh, okay, he also restores uh, these old telescopes as a machine shop and a electronics lab. And uh, this telescope, a nine-inch refractor, is now set up in Colorado somewhere to be used uh, with uh, with the public. Okay, sometimes he uh, also has picked up some rather unusual telescopes like this uh, relay Cassegrain. I won't get into what that means, but uh, it's a, a really a unusual design. I decided to show that to you just to show how weird some telescopes can get. Okay, uh, now the final thing about the Antique Telescope Society is that we are also a travel group. Uh, once a year, we have an annual meeting and we usually go to some observatory, old observatory, to uh, get a, 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 an in-depth custom tour of the facility. So uh, when the group started in 1992, uh, they visited the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't hear about them until 1994 when I saw an events uh, listing in the Sky and Telescope magazine that they were saying that they were coming out to visit uh, observatories out here. And so I decided I immediately contacted uh, uh, one of their people and registered for the tour. And uh, that's how I got involved with the ATS. And you can see all the other places that uh, we've been to, and not only here in the US, but also in Europe, where we have gone to England, we've gone to uh, Hamburg, Germany, and uh, and uh, in 2020, the group was supposed to go to Italy to tour observatories in uh, in Florence and uh, maybe go to Rome, uh, where they were uh, anticipating on visiting the Vatican observatories uh, with a tour given by I think there's a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Father Guy Consomagno who wrote a book uh, some years ago called. Uh, turn left at uh, Orion, and uh, so he's been made fa He became famous for for that for that book. So anyway, uh, if you're interested in touring old old observatories, there's no uh, uh, outfit uh, better to do this with than uh, than than the ATS. Okay, um, so uh, as I say, um, uh, part part of this talk is about. Uh, the history of the telescope, uh, uh, as illustrated by uh, things that uh, I actually saw on tours with the ATS. Now, the telescope was invented in 1608, rather accidentally, uh, by this gentleman, uh, Hans Lipperhey. And uh, uh, when he was a spectacle maker in Middleburg, uh, the Netherlands, which is located at that marking on the Google Maps uh, here thing. Uh, and um, uh, he applied for a patent on this invention uh, uh, with the States General. And uh, let's see. And while we, and we visited uh, Middleburg, uh, the Netherlands in the 2008 at exactly uh, 400 years after the invention of the telescope. And we went to the location of his house, actually. Uh, the Dutch had, had a, uh, uh, a habit of uh, building their houses, many of their houses as lean-tos up against the walls of their churches. <clears throat> and it turns out that the location of uh, Lipperhey's house is right uh, at the corner, the near corner of the, the church here uh, of, uh, called the Langeyan. It, the, uh, the Dutch have 
a habit of building these churches with uh, gigantically uh, very high uh, church steeples, uh, which are very ornate. And uh, so this, so he had his house uh, located here up against uh, uh, the Longyon Church in Middleburg. So we actually went to the location of his house, which is uh, located here. And uh, now there's another gentleman who has some claim to uh, inventing the telescope. Uh, his name is Zacharias Janssen. And uh, he actually lived in a lean to house just on the other side of that church. And uh, his uh, claim is uh, rather weaker than the uh, claim that uh, than than the claim that uh, uh, Lipperhey had, but and he had somewhat of a peripatetic, uh, shadowy background uh, because he was uh, accused of uh, engaging in counterfeiting uh, currency, and uh, and unfortunately uh, the 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 penalty for uh, counter being convicted of counterfeiting currency in those days was to get boiled in oil. And uh, so he it was, uh, so he was always on the run, uh, trying to keep ahead of his, of, uh, of the authorities. Uh, but nonetheless, he has an interesting uh, part in the story of uh, the invention of the telescope. So uh, Janssen's house was located at, at this site and, and uh, we were taken there by the guide who uh, took us around Middleburg in 2008. And um, what I discovered later on, however, which, which was really amazing to me, was that Lipperhey's house actually survived all the way into the mid 20th century. And uh, this is a late 19th century photograph of the church as it was at that time. And uh, the, the house to the far right, uh, the, the brick two-story house there, uh, is actually Lipperhey's house. And this was photographed in uh, the maybe uh, in uh, in maybe the 1890s or something like that, and is uh, uh, located at the point uh, designated number two. Now Janssen's house is uh, uh, was built as a lean-to up against the opposite wall of the church at uh, location number one, and uh, so now we have an, a notion of where the telescope was actually invented. Uh, this is a 19th century painting of that location and the house on the far, the brown uh, brick house on the right, on uh, the far right is, um, is uh, was actually Lipper Hay's house. Now, unfortunately, uh, that house didn't survive the Second World War. Uh, Middleburg was bombed by uh, the invading Germans at that time. And you can see all the damage that was done. And one of the victims of uh, that uh, bombardment was uh, Hans Lipperhey's old house. Um, however, there is a small astronomical museum in the Middleburg named after a 17th century Dutch astronomer by the name of uh, Philippus uh, Lansbergen. And this is the uh, uh, front uh, uh, entrance to the uh, museum. And inside of it is a reconstructed uh, facade of uh, Lipperhey's house. Uh, even has a little sign that says Lipperhey on it. Now, Middleburg has a beautiful 16th century vintage uh, city hall, uh, late Gothic city hall. Uh, this is not the original building. It the original building was destroyed in the Second World War, but it's been completely rebuilt uh, after the pattern of the original city hall, even to the point of uh, antiquing, antiquing the walls to make them look old, actually, when you walk in there, it's pretty amazing. And what we saw in there were the original patent documents that uh, Lipper Hay filed in October of 1608. We were there in October of uh, 2008. So we were there literally on the almost exact 400th anniversary of the invention of the telescope. And here is uh, the uh, uh, one of the uh, patent papers uh, that, that documented his application for a patent. Uh, this is, of course, in 17th century Dutch, which I don't read, but you can see uh, Lipperhey's name at the very top line here, a little bit off to the right here. So, so if you're thinking about uh, telescopes uh, and uh, like uh, Palomar and uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Telescope and even thinking about your own consumer grade telescopes uh, that you own and use, uh, it, the whole story starts here. 
and uh, and we still have the uh, the origin of uh, of that uh, pathway. Now, while we were there, the city of Middleburg was celebrating that 400th anniversary, and uh, in their local museum, uh, they had a big display. <clears throat> had a big display of uh, mostly 17th century telescopes. That metal tube in the back that you see, the brown metal tube in the back is often described to as a, uh, as a product of, uh, of the efforts of Zacharias uh, Janssen, actually, the second person that I mentioned uh, who was involved in the origin of the telescope. Now, the problem with these early telescopes was that uh, they were all refractors. Uh, the problem with all these uh, uh, early refractors was they suffered very badly from chromatic aberration in which the lens breaks up the white light coming in from the object that you are observing into its constituent uh, <clears throat> colors. And each color is, uh, uh, is uh, refracted in a different way with the result that you don't get a common focus for all the wavelengths of light. And you end up with uh, uh, out of focus images with uh, lots of color fringes. Um, so at the time, the only way to mitigate this problem was to make lenses that had extremely long focal lengths. Uh, and uh, and uh, so as a result, we, uh, we, we, we have uh, all these uh, very, very long telescopes that, uh, that we, um, that, uh, that, uh, that have come down to us. And uh, let's see, I have to switch over to another slideshow, which is uh, because of right. the, problem, the problems that I had with, uh, with PowerPoint. So uh, I have three, three of these all together. So this is the second one. So this will come up in just a moment and we'll get, get it started. Okay, let's see. Oops. Things in the way again. Okay, everybody can see that pretty good? Mm -hmm. Galileo. Okay, good. So anyway, in 1609, um, a letter was received by Galileo Galilei in, uh, in Florence that was sent to him by a papal ambassador who was, uh, <clears throat> who was in the service of the, of the papacy in the Netherlands. And uh, when he read the description of the telescope of uh, what this tele of this uh, new invention, the telescope, uh, he decided to make one for himself. He never actually had uh, seen the, the uh, invention coming in from uh, the Dutch, but uh, uh, but uh, but the description was good enough for him to make his own telescopes. So uh, then, of course, everybody knows the story of how Galileo uh, was the first person to actually use. Uh, the telescope for systematically looking at objects in the sky. Um, he made a whole number of telescopes for uh, rich patrons, of which two of them uh, still survive to this day. They are located in the Institute for the History of Science in uh, Florence. It's in a, a beautiful palazzo, which is located just behind the, uh, the Uffizi Art Gallery. In, uh, in Florence. So if you're in Florence, Italy, uh, you might, uh, uh, after you're, you finished with going to the art gallery to see the works of Botticelli and so forth, uh, you can go to this museum and take a look at uh, Galileo's uh, original telescope. Um, the, the ivory frame that you see at the bottom there uh, is uh, actually has the, the original lens uh, of the telescope that Galileo used to discover the Galilean moons. Um, I did not see uh, this set up with the ATS, but uh, uh, I went, uh, we went to uh, Florence uh, in 2004 to uh, observe the, uh, the transit of Venus at that time. And uh, so we had a chance to go to uh, the Institute to take a look at these artifacts. Oops, uh, let me see what's going on here. Oh, okay. And so this is a close-up of that lens. It's broken into two pieces uh, by, uh, apparently by Galileo himself, uh, but fortunately he retrieved the pieces and kept them. And as a result of that, uh, we have 
uh, this lens uh, uh, with us uh, today. Okay, now Galileo did uh, improve his telescopes over time, and you can see how that progress uh, can be seen um, by uh, Galileo's uh, view, uh, drawings of Saturn. Um, when he first looked at Saturn, his telescope was not good enough to show uh, the rings uh, particularly well, and the best he could tell uh, was the best best he could tell was uh, is the drawing that you see from 1610 above. But by 1616, his telescopes were good enough to actually start showing uh, that Saturn uh, may have had uh, had a ring from. Uh, but he wasn't quite sure what he was looking at still, and so he apparently did not publish this, uh, this, this drawing and declared it to be a ring. Um, that, uh, oh, this, uh, this is something that I found uh, uh, while doing uh, more uh, online research. Uh, this is the earliest known illustration of a telescope. It was uh, drawn into a letter by a fellow by the name of uh, Giovanni Battista uh, della Porta, and it's dated uh, from, uh, six, from August of 1609. So this is the earliest illustration of a telescope that we still have. Now, the resolution of what uh, was going around of, of what Saturn looked like really came, uh, was, um, uh, was due to this fellow, uh, uh, Christian Huygens, who was a Dutch mathematician and philosopher. And uh, his telescopes, uh, although they were very long and unwieldy, uh, finally were good enough to actually show that Saturn had rings around them. And so he, uh, he came to the proper interpretation of what uh, Saturn was uh, really looked like and, uh, and why the rings changed their appearance over, over time um, uh, in this book, uh, Systema Saturnium. Uh, or the, uh, sat the, the system of Saturn. Uh, this is actually an original sketch of Saturn in one of his notebooks that was on display at the Borjavi Museum in Leiden, uh, which we were, which we, where we held our meeting in 2008. And uh, these are some of the lenses that uh, <clears throat> Huygens made. Um, by the uh, uh, mid to late uh, 17th century, they still hadn't solved the problem of chromatic aberration. And so the astronomers and telescope makers at that time were still making really long telescopes. And um, Huygens' solution to this was to make something called uh, the aerial telescope, which consisted of the objective lens and its cell uh, suspended on a pole. And then uh, the focuser uh, then stretched out on a on a uh, rope line that uh, allowed him to line up the focuser with the lens. Now the, this kind of technology kind of went to uh, ridiculous lengths, and uh, this fellow Johannes Hevelius built per perhaps the largest version of this telescope ever, and uh, this is the 150 foot telescope, uh, even though it's 150 feet long. Of uh, the lens probably is not much bigger than uh, five, four or five inches. Uh, and uh, so um, he claimed in his uh, writings that this was an easy telescope to use, uh, but I think he was a bit probably actually optimistic. <laughs> anyway, the problem of chromatic aberration um, first had its uh, serious attempt at uh, a resolution with this fellow, Isaac Newton, that everybody knows about. And um, he decided to use mirrors to make a telescope. Uh, and this was beginning in the uh, late uh, 1660s. And this drawing uh, from 1668 is uh, his first drawing of his design for a reflecting telescope. Uh, so we still have this, and I think the University of Cambridge has this in its possession. And um, uh, when the Royal Society heard about his telescope, um, uh, they asked him to make one and send it to them uh, for examination uh, and demonstration. And this is that, and that was in, uh, and this was that telescope which he sent to them in 1671. Uh, the original, which you see here, is um, on display in a glass case in the Library of the Royal Society in London. Um, and uh, it is, 
there's one article that I read that claims that the uh, mirror in this telescope, <clears throat> which is made of um, a metal metal rather than glass, something called speculum metal, um, is thought to be maybe the mirror from the first telescope, the 1668 telescope, whereas the tube assembly is uh, from 1671. So uh, this is uh, this is rather interesting. So this is the, the world's first working reflecting telescope. And uh, there is yours truly, uh, younger me in those days. And uh, there is a handwritten manuscript next to the telescope uh, off to the right that you see there, which I think is the handwritten manuscript for optics in which uh, Newton described this telescope among other things and his theory of light, uh, which was subsequently published in 1704. However, um, a, an earlier publication on the reflecting telescope uh, it does show up in the transactions of the, uh, or philo philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. And of course, uh, in those days, uh, I had to carry around a film camera and a, uh, and a portable VHS recorder to take uh, all of my uh, uh, pictures. But um, uh, nowadays I can do all that with an iPhone. So uh, technology mar marches on. Okay, now well, there were some, a couple of predecessors to uh, Newton who would invent, who uh, proposed designs for the reflecting telescope, uh, most notably James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician who proposed the, this uh, thing called the Gregorian, which was now called the Gregorian telescope after, uh, after uh, Mr. Gregory. And then uh, a French uh, mathematician by the name of uh, Cassegrain, Laurent Cassegrain, um, uh, was also proposed. However, neither of these men ever built actual working physical telescopes. And uh, Newton, who was not a nice, nice fellow, uh, strongly criticized, particularly uh, Cassegrain, because he was a Frenchman, uh, that uh, that their that their designs were. Uh, uh, were were not worth the paper they were they were written on, and indeed uh, the problem was the, the real problem was that the mirror making technology of the time did not uh, allow for the making of the kinds of mirrors that these telescopes would have needed to make uh, to make them work, and indeed the uh, Cassegrain and Gregorian telescopes were not able to be made for at least another century until the mid 18th century. And that was when we finally see examples of those kinds of telescopes actually being made. Okay, well, uh, as part of that trip, which was 1996, uh, we also went to visit uh, Isaac Newton's house, which is uh, located uh, uh, a couple of hours uh, drive uh, north of London. Uh, in, it's called Woolsthorpe Manor. Uh, the house was actually built uh, by uh, Newton's great-great-grandfather. Uh, who acquired the land around 1563 and then built this uh, farmhouse. Um, Newton was born and raised here. And then uh, he went to the University of Cambridge for his education. Uh, however, around 1666, around 1665 rather, uh, the plague hit London and uh, forced him back uh, to this house uh, to wait out the, the plague, which had also spread to Cambridge at that time. And while he was there, uh, he uh, invented the uh, calculus, discovered the multicolor wavelength, the uh, uh, nature of white light, among other, uh, among other things, and uh, did uh, a lot of other mathematical things. Of course, uh, Newton's house has to have an apple tree in front of it. And uh, although this may not be the original apple tree in front of, uh, of uh, Newton's house, it's uh, uh, there are, there's yours truly. Uh, okay, so the house is a small museum and you can visit it. And it's decorated with uh, period furniture along with a portrait of Newton. And you can see at the bottom, there's a replica of his uh, reflecting telescope. Now, uh, for refractors, the solution to uh, chromatic aberration uh, started with this gentleman, uh, Chester Moore Hall, who was a barrister who worked in London, and uh, he had an interest in optics. And he came up with a design for 
uh, <clears throat> what came to be known as an achromatic lens made up of two components. One was the original was the uh, uh, original lens uh, that would uh, focus uh, the that would acquire the light from the from the object to perform an image, and then coupled that up with a second uh, element, uh, a second element which um, uh, which would bring the uh, dispersed uh, colors of light uh, back together to form a proper image. And he did this around uh, 1730. Uh, and uh, and uh, he sent, um, he sent, uh, it's just a story behind this. He sent uh, uh, the two com different components to be made supposedly by uh, separate contractors. And uh, so that they wouldn't know what he was doing. Uh, however, uh, those two contractors were too busy to fulfill his his uh, his request, and both of them sent them to another person uh, to uh, to uh, to make the different com components. Turned out that that person was the same person, and it was a fellow by the name of George Bass. And when he got the uh, two requests for making these two. Uh, lenses, uh, he put two and two together and decided that these were uh, supposedly to, uh, made to, to work together. So uh, he re reversed engineered the, acrim uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the lens into uh, and discovered that uh, him for himself that uh, this, uh, this type of uh, design would be achromatic. Uh, now George Bass then uh, uh, accidentally communicated his uh, discovery to this fellow, uh, John Dolan, who at the time was also working on trying to solve the problem of uh, chromatic aberration in refractors. And uh, so he essentially stole the idea and uh, uh, founded a company to start making achromatic uh, refractors. Um, this of course eventually led to a lot of lawsuits between the, uh, the supporters of Chester Moore Hall and the Dolans, but, uh, but eventually somehow that, that settled uh, but, and not before they, they all died. Now, he founded this uh, uh, company to make, initially make telescopes and it was subsequently followed up by, uh, uh, Peter, by his son, uh, Peter Dolan, uh, who uh, is credited, who actually credited with inventing the triplet apochromat uh, refractor design. So if you think about the lens, uh, telescopes like uh, AP uh, apochromats and uh, Orion apochromats, uh, this is the fellow who invented uh, that kind of refractor telescope design. Okay, so uh, this is uh, how achromatic lenses work. Uh, they're uh, the original biconvex, uh, uh, bi bicon Vex uh, objective lens breaks up the light into its consist constituent colors, uh, and they focus at different different uh, focal planes along the optical axis, producing that out of out of focus colorized image. And so, what Hall did was he uh, developed a uh, a design of a secondary uh, component that uh, brought the colors of uh, light back together again to produce a white light image. Uh, now Dolan went on to become a very su 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 successful telescope making company. And actually the company still exists today. And it is a primarily, however, involved in making eyewear for people kind of like lens craft, kind of like a, a UK version of uh, lens crafters. And, uh, excuse me. Uh, lens crafters, and uh, so um, and so, they're still around. Now, uh, the next step in the development of the telescope was to improve the mechanics of uh, telescopes, and this fell to this gentleman, um, another Englishman by the name of Jesse Ramsden. He was active in the second half of the 18th century, and uh, uh, he was a precision machinist who developed ways to make to mount telescopes in highly precision, high precision mountings. Uh, so what he's responsible for 
is to enable the conversion of the telescope into a high precision instrument, which could uh, make uh, very precise measurements. And it was uh, through, through his efforts that the technology developed that enabled people uh, like uh, uh, that for, for people to, uh, to uh, measure parallaxes and, uh, and, uh, and measure double stars, uh, for example. And uh, here he is portrayed with a couple of his uh, uh, products. Uh, one is a device uh, known as, a, that he's resting his hand on as a dividing engine. And what a dividing engine is, is uh, it enables uh, high precision uh, divisions of circles to make uh, things like setting circles. And uh, a, uh, a, an example of uh, one of his telescopes in the background is known as the Palermo circle, uh, which is uh, a, an altazimuth uh, mounted telescope that, uh, that, has, uh, that enables high precision measurements of azimuth and, uh, and altitude. And actually we have, we still have both of these uh, devices. This is uh, one of his uh, dividing engines. I don't know how many he actually made. Uh, curiously enough, this dividing engine is in the possession of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. And it is on display at the Museum of American History uh, in Washington. So this is where I first saw the thing. That is where I first saw the thing. And uh, if you go to Washington, DC and visit the museum, you will have an opportunity to take a look at this, uh, this very interesting uh, device, which was a great advance over the, uh, uh, the uh, accuracy of uh, older um, uh, surveying uh, features of the telescope. Now, uh, pre uh, semi -pre precise circles have been made before. Like for example, Tycho Brahe in the late 16th century was able to make very ac fairly accurate uh, 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 measuring instruments for uh, measuring uh, planetary positions. Good enough, as a matter of fact, to produce tables that allowed Johannes Kepler to develop his uh, laws of planetary motion. Uh, but uh, Ramsden apparently uh, took this level of accuracy to a, a whole new level and uh, produced even more accurate uh, telescopes. Um, we also have uh, uh, the Palermo circle that I mentioned in, in the portrait. That's, uh, that uh, is at the Palermo Observatory in Sicily. And it was with this telescope that uh, the Italian astronomer uh, Giuseppe Piazzi uh, made the first asteroid discovery in 1801. And uh, so, uh, so we still have that instrument. Of course, uh, NASA has since sent the spacecraft to a survey series. And so uh, that, brings us, uh, that brings us to the uh, final uh, uh, discovery uh, relating to asteroids. Now, um, telescopes from this time uh, are, have, have a sort of a, uh, refractor telescopes at this time have a, a sort of a curious look to them in the sense that uh, uh, many of them have these uh, wildly uh, elaborate and overbuilt mountings uh, made with the most advanced uh, machining uh, uh, techniques at the time coming from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but as you can see here, the telescopes that they mount are <laughs> absolutely puny. Um, and this is only a four inch telescope. And, uh, and the reason why was because telescope makers at that time were limited in how big uh, the glass blanks that were available to, for, to them for making refractor telescopes. And the problem of getting um, uh, uniformly, uh, uniform uh, glass blanks that were good enough to make lenses uh, was not uh, on the, completely on their way to solution until for another 50 or 60 years into the future, into the uh, first uh, third to uh, first half of the, uh, of the 19th century. But uh, telescopes from this uh, latter 18th century period had a tendency to uh, be, at least refractor telescopes, had a tendency to be uh, rather small. Okay. Okay, well, I, uh, before we go on further, I'd like to mention that uh, during our 1996 trip, we had also had a uh, chance to visit the Royal Greenwich Observatory 
uh, in Greenwich Park in uh, outside London. Uh, and uh, this uh, observatory was established in 1675 by uh, Charles II at the uh, urging of the Royal Society uh, to uh, try and find a solution for finding longitude at sea. And uh, so this is the building that uh, they were headquartered in. <clears throat> and uh, see, you can see in the back um, that mast with the ball in it is something called a time ball. And uh, when, uh, uh, the, uh, when John Harrison's method of finding longitude at sea by uh, using a clock, using a chronometer, was finally adopted. Uh, what the observatory did was they placed this ball uh, in a mast, and it was hoisted. The ball was hoisted up the top of the mast at one o'clock each day, uh, at precisely one o'clock, according to their uh, calculations. Uh, they would drop the ball down so all the sea captains uh, in ships out on the Thames could see that it was one o'clock, and they could all synchronize. Their, uh, their navigation chronometers. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Greenwich is uh, the location of the uh, loca location of the zero degrees longitude or the prime meridian. And uh, this is the, um, uh, the location of the uh, telescope that uh, defines the location of the prime meridian uh, is defined by this telescope which is a refractor that was uh, put in place. Oh, uh, let's see. I believe in 1853. Okay, uh, so yeah, around uh, around eight, uh, the 1850s. And, um, and so this was the telescope that made observations to uh, determine uh, things like the, the rate of rotation of the earth to a high level of precision uh, all the way from uh, when it was um, uh, implemented in the 1850s. And the last observations made with this telescope uh, was in uh, 1954, actually. Of course, there are guides around who are dressed in period costume who uh, will give you nice tours of the observatory. And... Uh, this is a picture of the primary observing room at the observatory as it uh, was then. The portraits at the top show uh, uh, King Charles II uh, off to the left. And uh, he was the person who was uh, responsible for helping to finance the construction of this observatory. And on the right is his brother uh, who became uh, King, Charles, King James II uh, after Charles had died. Unfortunately, um, uh, James II was a Catholic and he tried to reconvert uh, England back to Catholicism after it had uh, become Protestant during the time of Henry VIII. And uh, the English uh, weren't, uh, weren't fond of that. And uh, so they, they deposed him and uh, sent him packing to Ireland. Um, below is my uh, older daughter and her husband uh, who were there touring the observatory at the time. Okay, and the building looks uh, very similar to what it looked like uh, back in the late 17th century. This is an engraving from that time, so it's pretty much identical. Uh, here's uh, one of those long focus refractors uh, uh, with uh, being with some of the tourists posing with it. Um, there are, and the building of course is full of old telescopes. Um, this, I believe, is the original zenith instrument that was used in 1727 by James Bradley to discover uh, a phenomenon known as the aberration of light. And I won't get into a long explanation about it, but um, uh, it, because he, uh, because of his interpretation of what of what he was seeing, uh, he was able to uh, perform one of the first calculations of the speed of light. Um, he was not uh, not uh, not uh, uh, not very accurate about it, but on the other hand, it was a uh, a, a well thought out attempt to to do that. Um, now, in the 
late 18th century, a fellow by the name of John Harrison, whom most of you may have read about in a book called Longitude by uh, Davos Sobel, uh, came up with, uh, came up with the idea that one could find longitude at sea by carrying a clock on shipboard that would uh, uh, carry uh, the local time of uh, Greenwich or England uh, with you. And then you would compare that to your measurements of local time wherever you happen to be and uh, figure out how many hours of Earth's rotation you were away from uh, the prime meridian. And uh, so uh, uh, those of you who have read that book will, will have read about his struggles to develop a clock that was accurate to a few seconds uh, to be used on board a, a ship uh, that was uh, rocking around on the waves at sea. It was not, not an easy task. It took him some 40 years to uh, develop these uh, first uh, marine uh, chronometers. Uh, there are, uh, the big telescope at uh, Greenwich is this 28 inch uh, refractor uh, that was built by, um, uh, who is it, uh, Howard Grubb. And uh, this telescope is no longer used for any kind of research. It's, in fact, there's no research uh, being done at Greenwich anymore, um, but, uh, uh, but this telescope is open for public viewing if you have a chance to, uh, to go there. Okay, uh, let's see, I need to go on to the, the, the final slideshow. Uh, let me open that up. Uh, how are we doing on time? We're, we're doing actually pretty good. We're about half an hour into this. Uh, okay, this is the last section that will get us to 1800. And Linda, you were asking me for a picture of me uh, on uh, while traveling, and I have a few of you seen at least one of them. Uh, so I'll send those to you as soon as I can. Now the dominant telescope maker in the second half of the 18th century is this fellow, uh, William Herschel. Um, uh, he uh, actually came to England uh, at the age of 19. Um, as a migrant, uh, that was because he was born. He was born in Hanover, which at that time was the part of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which Voltaire was said was uh, uh, not holy, not Roman, and not an empire. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there he was, and um, uh, his father sent him and his brother off to England in, in an effort to uh, to avoid uh, having them conscript conscripted in the military service. And uh, he, was a, he was trained in music and he established himself as a musician in Bath, England. Um, later on, uh, he brought his sister, Caroline Herschel uh, with him and she migrated to England uh, along with him. Um, and she became initially his assistant and then a, uh, uh, an astronomer uh, uh, of uh, considerable note her, uh, herself. Actually, she's the first woman ever to have uh, discovered a comet. Uh, and, uh, and she discovered uh, many uh, star clusters, which eventually made it into a catalog uh, that Herschel had developed of uh, non-stellar objects uh, that uh, ultimately was combined with catalogs by Messier, and uh, a catalog developed later by uh, their, by his uh, by William's son, Sir John Herschel, uh, and that became the general catalog of uh, nebulae and clusters, and that was ultimately republished with additional observations into the new general catalog in 1888. And so the primary contribution of the Herschels was to find all the faint fuzzies in the sky that they could find and uh, put them into a, a massive catalog that we still use to this day. Uh, to learn more about the Herschels, uh, 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 in 1996, we went to Bath, England. And uh, you can see here the, uh, uh, this, uh, this beautiful abbey. 
that was built between the 12th and the 14th centuries uh, was built over an old Roman bath, uh, which you can see below. Uh, that bath was uh, buried and then subsequently re-excavated in the early 20th century. Um, and uh, this is Herschel's house, actually. It's located in uh, on 19 New King Street uh, in, in Bath, and it's now a small uh, museum uh, to the Herschels and to astronomy. It's uh, been redecorated with a uh, period late 18th century Georgian furniture. And in the back uh, is the, is his was his workshop. Uh, some of the some of his original tools that he used are, are located there, actually on display. And uh, in that workshop, he built these uh, small telescopes, generally about six inches in diameter, with a speculum metal mirror, uh, because glass uh, glass uh, couldn't be used for mirrors yet, because there was no way at that time of applying a reflective coating to them. Uh, that was still about 60 or 70 years away. Um, but anyway, uh, he actually became quite expert at building these telescopes. Uh, the gentleman that you, this is actually a replica of one of his telescopes, but uh, the gentleman you see standing there is uh, the late uh, Dr. Os uh, Donald Osterbrock, who was a professor of astronomy at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Unfortunately, he's passed away now, but uh, he was once the director of the Lick Observatory, actually. And then here's yours truly with that uh, uh, same telescope. Uh, there are actually a, a lot of uh, Herschel's original telescopes around. And there's a complete, I don't know exactly how many, but there's a complete catalog of them published in an article in the, Antique, in the Journal of the Antique Telescope Society. And so uh, I have a complete collection of that journal. So if anybody's interested in doing some historical research, uh, I, do have, uh, I do have a collection of, of that journal. Um, this is the backyard of uh, that house. It's the garden where the planet Uranus was discovered uh, in 1781. Uh, by Herschel using a telescope just like that of about six inches in diameter. Um, Herschel's favorite telescope, however, was this one. It was a, uh, what he called the 20 foot telescope, uh, which was the length of the tube, but, uh, but the diameter of the mirror is, uh, was 18 inches, uh, also of speculum metal. And um, it's, it's an altazimuth mounting and he had to have uh, a bunch of assistants move that thing around in order to enable him to point the telescope. His uh, observing methods for looking for faint fuzzies, however, generally was to point the telescope in the north-south uh, meridian and then um, move the telescope up and down to different declinations and then uh, locate the object. Uh, and once he saw the object, he would write a, uh, a a, uh, a description of the object and then uh, note its uh, declination position and uh, figure that at that time of day, at that time of night, uh, that object was crossing the meridian and from that uh, derived the, uh, uh, the proper uh, coordinates, celestial coordinates of the object. Now it turns out that we still have that telescope. Um, I quite accidentally wandered into it as an exhibition at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC back around 2005. And so here is the original 20 inch uh, uh, with a, uh, a mannequin observer at the top. Um, and here's the mirror, uh, which was on display next to it. It's a bad, because it's made of the speculum metal, it's a badly tarnished now. Uh, and uh, is definitely not usable, but uh, it's an interesting historical artifact uh, that we still have. Um, his son, uh, Sir, who, Sir John Herschel, took that telescope in 1834 down to Cape Town, uh, South Africa. And there he lived for four years uh, along with his family uh, and uh, used this telescope to extend his father's work 
in identifying faint fuzzies in the sky and developing a uh, expanding the catalog of uh, of uh, of, um, of faint fuzzies of, of uh, star clusters and nebulae uh, down in the southern hemisphere. Um, Hirsch, uh, John, uh, William Herschel went on to build an even bigger telescope, which is the 40 foot, of which there is a model here uh, that's located in the uh, Herschel Museum in Bath. And, um, and, and however, this telescope uh, turned out to be uh, rather cumbersome to use, and it has stretched the existing technology uh, to, uh, to its limits. Uh, so he didn't actually use this, although he built this telescope, he didn't use it very much. He uh, continued to primarily uh, use the 18-inch 18, the 18 or the 20-foot, and, uh, and that became, as I say, his favorite telescope. Um, that, this big, the big telescope, the 40-foot, uh, was uh, finally torn down in 1839, but not before Sir John uh, actually took a photograph of that telescope, one of the earliest photographs ever. And, uh, uh, and he was using technology that was developed by the French, most notably Louis uh, Daguerre, uh, who was the inventor of daguerreotypes. And uh, so we actually have a foot. This is probably the first photograph of a telescope. And, uh, and it's from, uh, from Sir John Herschel in 1839. Uh, we still have the mirror to this telescope. Uh, it's 48 inches in diameter, and it's on display in the Science Museum in Kensington, London. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the museum is just across the street from the Victoria and Albert uh, Art Museum. And you can see in the background is one of his, uh, one of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the senior Herschel's uh, original uh, uh, wooden, wood, wooden tube telescopes. We also have the, uh, the lower 10 feet of uh, the tube assembly uh, of the tube of that telescope. Um, apparently the uh, uh, upper portion of the tube got crushed by a falling tree. And so only the lower part of the tube has been saved. It is now at, uh, at the Royal Greenwich Observatory uh, serving as an out outdoor display. Uh, the location, of, by the way, of the 28 inch uh, uh, grub telescope is in that dome uh, in the background that you see there. So that's the public telescope that the observatory uh, uh, offers to the public for looking at the objects in the sky. Okay, I think I'm done. Uh, hopefully that's uh, at least for this time. I will be back in July to talk about uh, telescopes that, uh, I have visited, that we have visited um, date from uh, the 19th century and on into uh, the 20th century. And um, we'll finish our tour of the history of telescope uh, at that time. I right, thank you very much. All right, wonderful, thank you. Okay, so I hope, uh, hope uh, yeah, I mean, most of this stuff, I think most of it, most of you have never seen. So I think this, I hope this is a, uh, serves as kind of a unique uh, perspective on telescopes that the, uh, that uh, you've never experienced before. I did enjoy this. It was uh, like a virtual tour of, of yeah. some of these places I've never been, especially the Royal Observatory. That was that yes. was wonderful to see. Well, hopefully they'll open up the the tourist gates uh, pretty soon now that the pandemic is receding, and uh, you'll have a chance to to go there. But I I think you should put it on your bucket list. It's a definitely a worthwhile uh, place to go. Uh, by the way, all of the four uh, marine chronometers that uh, John Harrison uh, built in the, seven, in the 1770s uh, actually operate. And uh, you can go on YouTube and find uh, videos uh, of those things uh, working. Uh, the, uh, the chronometers were put in storage uh, at the observatory and forgotten about. And for and and uh, nobody even knew that they were there for the better part of uh, 120 or 130 years, and uh, then somebody found them, and uh, a Royal Navy uh, naval a retired naval officer, according to the book by Davis Sobel, uh, spent uh, 
a, a good part of his life uh, restoring them to working condition. So astonishingly, these uh, 150 year old clocks are still operating. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I love I love old time pieces and and the, <laughs> the oh, connections. Oh, you'll go crazy. You'll go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you I, will. I, you yeah. You 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 probably build a lean to up against the building and uh, <laughs> and, and live there. <laughs> Uh, let me see nowadays, because have... nowadays you can use an REI tent. <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm seeing um, chats come in, so let me let me review what what our um, our uh, listeners and watchers are saying. We've got a thank you, very cool. Um, uh, Liz writes a uh, very interesting presentation. Some of these antique telescopes are very ornate. Was this normal for scientific instruments in the 1600s, or were, were these built by artisans such as jewelers? Because they are innate, they seem especially fragile. Were they intended to be used in a single place, or were they meant to be portable? Well, uh, there were permanent um, observatories, uh, actually going all the way back to to, to Tycho Brahe, or even um, who is it? There's uh, an Indian um, mogul who built an observatory uh, uh, that is still with us, and you can go visit it. I, I forget his name uh, right off the bat, but. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, and then there's the Be Beijing Observatory. The Beijing Observatory was actually funded by um, Jesuits, uh, Jesuit priests who had gone to China to try and convert the Chinese to uh, to, to Catholicism, and as a, uh, a device to try and get in with the emperor, uh, they built uh, this observatory. The observatory uh, does not contain any telescopes uh, they were there in the uh, mid 17th century and uh, they didn't really actually have any telescopes with them uh, what they'd used were the models of Tycho Brahe's uh, uh, surveying instruments uh, to set up the observatory so if you want to see uh, what an observatory looked like in the uh, in Tycho Brahe's time uh, the place uh, oddly enough the place to go to is Beijing actually mm. and uh, and you can see uh, see what uh, what kinds of instruments that uh, Tycho Brahe used. I was surprised to hear from you. They they moved the telescope down to the southern hemisphere to Cape Town. It's it's quite a distance, and it was such a large instrument as well. Um, uh, yeah, it was a uh, it, no doubt. It was a logistically uh, uh, substantial move. <laughs> yeah. uh, however, um, what Sir John Herschel wanted to do was to uh, extend his father's work into the southern southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best way to do that was to uh, go to Cape Town. Cape Town was, uh, of course, is a place that's easily accessible by, by sea. So the uh, actual uh, effort to move anything overland uh, was uh, limited to just getting the instruments to a ship uh, in London and then, or Portsmouth. I don't know exactly where they left from um, and uh, uh, sailed down the, Western coast of Africa to South Africa and set up uh, set up the observatory, and mm -hmm. um, and the English didn't go to war with the uh, with the Afrikaners yet in the Boer War, which was uh, many a uh, hundred years later, and um, and so uh, so they were on friendly terms. Oh, we have a thank you from David in Austin, Texas. Thank you, David, and um, we got some uh, claps and thumbs ups from uh, Prasad. Uh, Philippe says a fascinating lecture. Thank you. Uh, Celeste, thank you. It was amazing. Uh, Philippe asks a question. How did we manage to machine lenses and mirrors sufficiently accurately to be able to observe planets uh, like, like Jupiter and Saturn in, in those days? Well, um, testing methods in those days were rather hit or miss, but mostly it was uh, uh, mostly what the uh, telescope makers did to test their optics was to uh, do a star test. And uh, they had to try and figure out, figure, try to figure out how, how to figure the uh, optic to produce, um, to produce a, pro a proper image. Um, over time, uh, many of the optical fabricators simply came up with formulaic uh, uh, self-invented uh, uh, techniques to make uh, to improve uh, the optics of uh, the of their of their telescope, 
um, Herschel uh, did did his uh, testing just with a star test. Uh, the Foucault, uh, Foucault test that we all know and love, and also the Ronke test uh, were, st were not to be invented until the 1860s and, uh, and, and later. I think the, the, the Foucault test uh, was uh, invented by, uh, by uh, Jean Foucault, I think in the 1860s, and the Ronke test uh, didn't come until uh, probably the latter part of the 19th or early part of the 20th century. I don't know the history of that uh, that well, but um, uh, but more precise tests of optics uh, had to wait until the latter part of the 19th century. Um, so it was kind of a hit or miss uh, thing. And actually, uh, a lot of these old optics have been uh, critically examined optically by modern uh, uh, optical fabricators using modern tests. Um, and some of them are actually very, very good, uh, astonishingly enough. Uh, but the quality control is not very even, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of good mirrors and a lot of good lenses, and there's a lot of bad mirrors and very bad lenses, uh, simply because uh, uh, the the people who were making them uh, didn't have the testing technology available to them to achieve a better. Um, a to, to achieve better quality control. control. And then we've got a, a follow-up question from Philippe. I think uh, using alt as scopes meant that they had to adjust the position of the large bulky contraptions constantly, which must have been challenging. How did they manage that? Well, they, there's a mathematical conversion between uh, alt azimuth uh, coordinates and celestial coordinates. And uh, so, and why the uh, why 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 the why a teles why the uh, Palermo circle, for example, was built as an as a uh, altazimuth uh, telescope? I I do not know. Um, for reason, for some reason, they contracted uh, um, Ramson to make uh, an altazimuth telescope, and probably they had uh, some surveying uh, issues that they wanted to use the telescope to resolve. And, uh, and in addition to uh, using it on the sky, and uh, maybe that was the, uh, the motivation, I, I, I simply don't know. But, um, mm. um, but, uh, but in the case of Herschel, um, uh, he didn't, I don't know how much, I don't know if he actually knew about equatorial uh, mountings, um, but he probably didn't have access to uh, the kind of, um, uh, fabrication shop that could build such a such a thing for him so he was confined to just uh, uh, making a, a simple carriage uh, that uh, could be elevated that could elevate his telescope um, in altitude and then he would move uh, the telescope around on on wheels now as I mentioned his observing technique consisted of uh, uh, locating his telescope uh, on the uh, north south meridian and uh, so in that situation he could observe uh, just through using elevation or altitude adjustments and then um, using his altitude to determine um, his altitude uh, uh, adjustment to determine declination and then uh, and then and then uh, then figure then figure his uh, uh, ra uh, from uh, from the meridian and uh, and and the time of and the time of night that he was uh, uh, working on. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I don't know if Steve I don't know if Steve Gottlieb is in the audience, but he would know uh, more about this uh, about that for sure uh, because he's been uh, spending the last several decades uh, reobserving all of the NGC objects and trying to refine their positions and to eliminate the uh, errors mm -hmm. that have crept into the catalog uh, over the years. Hmm. And the handpiece of my Celestron has his corrections in them. Hmm. So well, that's great. Cor that's correct. His, uh, yep. his corrections have, uh, has been put into the uh, electronic database of all the hand controllers of uh, the modern go-to telescopes. That's correct. Well, 
Uh, this I, has been I, such a rich, a rich uh, experience of the things you've brought us through. <laughs> We've just had our, our 70th anniversary and what started SFAA was largely telescope making. Mm -hmm. And that brought the group together. Yes. So I know that many, many people are so pleased to hear your wonderful story tonight. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see that uh, uh, as you, as you n noted uh, uh, from uh, amateur telescopes, uh, you know, John Dobson is mm. uh, now part of the story of the history of the telescope, and uh, we need to recognize that. And uh, and so when I did my old version of the talk, uh, he was uh, yeah, he was uh, he was definitely a prominent part of the end of my presentation. Mm. Yeah, and and the EV scope that you have now is a new generation of kind oh, of telescope. That's a whole. That's a whole that's a whole new approach to uh, the telescopes. Uh, there, there's nothing. There's nothing particularly unusual about the EV scope, but uh, but it's just the way they um, they combined uh, uh, old all the uh, usual elements of uh, of a telescope in a way is to make it really lightweight and useful and sensitive. Uh, that uh, you know, it's it comes just in time. Uh, as I'm uh, approaching my old age, and I don't want to lift 100-pound telescopes anymore, <laughs> and um, this thing only weighs like 20 pounds, and uh, yeah. I can take it into my backyard, get it set up, and it's observing uh, or taking an image uh, inside of five to ten minutes. And I'm just amazed at uh, how how they've uh, they've developed that uh, that 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 telescope. I, I I I understand it's actually selling pretty well. They do have some competition from an outfit called uh, another French company called Veonis, uh, who have uh, come up with a similar telescope in a refractor configuration called the Stellina telescope. Um, and Veonis is coming out with a shorter focus version of uh, the, the uh, uh, go-to refractor. Uh, uh, and uh, let's see, I forget what the name of it is right off the bat, but. It, uh, it's that thing is actually supposed to uh, cost only about 1450. It has about half the focal length of the Stellina and costs about half as much. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, for wider field views, uh, you could probably even take a single picture of the entire, um, uh, was it uh, Andromeda galaxy uh, with that thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so for everyone, uh, not just for us oldsters, you know, I, I, I highly recommend uh, both the Unistellar and the Veonis uh, telescopes as a, uh, as a, uh, as a, uh, a new way to observe uh, with telescopes. And, and uh, although, it, although it produces astrophotos and they're not of the highest quality, uh, it's, uh, it's good enough. Yeah. You know? and, and you can uh, download these, uh, pictures uh, in in just minutes, literally, it's amazing. Several of our members have have that scope. Okay. Yes, and yeah. and they'll send me pictures of what they've taken with it. So, <laughs> yeah. So we look forward to your part two very yes. very much, and I'm so happy this has been recorded, so that people can go back and and refresh their memories on some of these details and see the yes. images again. And I thank and, you uh, so very very much. So uh, uh, I encourage people to visit some of these places and see these things for themselves. It's uh, quite a, uh, a different kind of experience and uh, maybe even join the Antique Telescope Society and uh, hopefully they'll put together a trip and go to Italy uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometime soon, maybe this year or, or next. Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Well, you're very welcome. I look forward to seeing my re my recording. I, I don't know if I'll be hor horribly embarrassed. What no, you won't. You'll be, you'll be <laughs> so happy you told us so many great things. <laughs> okay. It was a great show. Great show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you.